Okay, we are live everywhere. We may as well get started. Welcome to the Exeter Historical Society's March virtual program. Thank you for joining us. I'm Barbara Rimkunis, co-executive director of the Exeter Historical Society. Please excuse the train that has decided to go past my house right now. This program comes to you in Mesquamskuk, now called Exeter, in Nadakana, the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the Alnaba people who have stewarded Nadakana and its Aki, Nibi, Olakwakak, and Owa'asak, the land, the waterways, the flora, the fauna throughout the generations. We'd like to thank Exeter TV for bringing this program to you through Zoom. The program is also being presented on our Facebook page and on channel 98. Our April program will be held at the Exeter Town Hall at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, April 5th. We're gonna try to hold a program in person. John and Donna Moody, who were optimistically scheduled for last year's program, will be presenting Town by Town, Watershed by Watershed, Native Americans in New Hampshire, sponsored by the New Hampshire Humanities Council. The program will be broadcast on Channel 98 and will be available at a later time on the website and Facebook page. Tonight, my co-executive director, Laura Martin, will be monitoring the Q&A dialog box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type your questions there. If you're listening on Facebook, you can write the question in the comments and we'll try to get to those as well. If you're interested in learning more about Exeter's history, visit our website at www.exeterhistory.org. And if you're a member of the society, we thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, UNH history professor, Elijah Gould. His scholarship focuses on the American Revolution with an emphasis on the revolution's outer history in the Americas, Africa, Europe, and the wider world. His current book project, Crucible of Peace, the Turbulent History of America's Founding Treaty examines the least studied of the United States founding documents, the Treaty of 1783 that ended the American Revolutionary War. In his Among the Powers of the Earth, the American Revolution and the Making of a New World Empire, he explored the manifold ways in which the early American Republic's quest to be accepted as treaty-worthy nation by Europe's colonial powers shaped America, American thinking about an array of issues including federalism, Native American treaty rights, and the abolition of slavery. In addition to being recognized at UNH for excellence in teaching and research, Gould has held long-term fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Fulbright Hayes Program, the National Endowment for the Humanities, twice, and the Charles Warren Center at Harvard. Gould's other publications include The Persistence of Empire, British Political Culture in the Age of the American Revolution, and Empire and Nation, the American Revolution in the Atlantic World, co-edited with Peter Onuf, as well as numerous articles, book chapters, and review essays. We are fortunate to have him with us this evening. Please, thank you for joining us tonight. It's all yours. Barbara, thank you very much for that generous uh, invitation. And uh, thank you. Thank you to Laura Martin, uh, who invited me to give this talk, Exeter TV. Um, I, I think I'm sure like everyone, uh, I wish we could be in person. I, I did give a, a talk a couple years ago uh, in the Exeter Town Hall. And the energy of talking about these things before a live audience can't be beat. So uh, I'll try to keep the energy up here on Zoom. Uh, I'm gonna talk, uh, I'm planning to talk for about 40 minutes and then uh, leave time for uh, question and answers. Uh, and uh, so that if you have questions, please feel free to ask them. And I think Laura is gonna be uh, uh, running those. I think you have to be on Zoom or in Facebook to actually ask a question. Anyway, so, so as, the, as the talk title suggests, I wanna talk today, this evening about Alexander Hamilton and the making of the United States. Uh, though Hamilton himself is a fascinating figure. Uh, uh, also an oftentimes misunderstood figure. Um, I wouldn't say that historically he's been a much loved figure. He's, he's controversial. Uh, Hamilton the musical changed that. I remember when I first saw there was going to be uh, a musical about Alexander Hamilton like 
most other historians of the American Revolution, I thought, well, <laughs> you know, good luck with that. But of course, it's an extraordinary event. If you've seen it, uh, uh, you, you know what an incredible job Lin-Manuel Miranda did with it. Uh, I will say that Hamilton the Musical captures parts of Alexander Hamilton's life uh, while obscuring others. Uh, I won't, we don't have time uh, to talk about all of Hamilton's life, uh, but uh, I wanna talk, I wanna touch on three aspects of his public life. Uh, uh, first, Hamilton the self-made man, which is of course a theme in the musical. Hamilton the nationalist, and I'll say more about that when I come to that part. And then finally, Hamilton the partisan. And all of this, if you've seen the musical, will probably have a familiar ring. Uh, but as I think you'll see, uh, um, some of the, the deep controversy and uh, that, that Hamilton inspired in his life and after uh, is uh, uh, not fully captured, I think, by the musical. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Okay. So uh, Alexander Hamilton, and uh, of course, here we have the musical. Um, uh, for, for those of you who haven't seen Lin-Manuel Miranda up on the right, uh, and uh, uh, Lin-Manuel with the other three leading casts uh, down below. So uh, as you'll know from the musical, uh, Hamilton was, uh, um, he's, he was born, uh, um, uh, 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 he was born on the island of Nevis, in the British West Indies in 1757, we think. Sometimes his birth date is given as 55, but we now think uh, more likely he was born in 1757. Uh, his uh, parents were not married. Uh, his mother, Rachel Fawcett Levine, uh, was, uh, 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 was separated, estranged from her husband uh, and took up with a merchant by the name of James Hamilton. Uh, and uh, they had two children, uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton's older brother, James Hamilton Jr. and Alexander, and they moved uh, with, uh, with their two sons to St. Croix, which is a Danish island also in the West Indies uh, in 1765. So the father deserted the family in 1766. Uh, um, and uh, Hamilton's mother died of yellow fever in 1768, at which point he and his brother were separated. Uh, Alexander was adopted by a Nevis merchant named Thomas Stevens. Uh, and uh, so a very hard scrabble existence. He's orphaned at a young age. Uh, and uh, I would say that, that one of the interesting, one of the things uh, the the uh, Hamilton, the musical, plays up the fact that uh, uh, Hamilton was an immigrant in growing in New York and in his career in the United States. His poverty and illegitimacy was much more of an issue uh, in his uh, life. Um, early on, Hamilton distinguished himself as brilliant. Uh, he, before his mother's death in 1768, this would be uh, when he was 11, uh, we think, um, uh, he was hired uh, as a clerk by the New York, uh, by, by a New York merchant firm based in St. Croix by the name of Kruger and Beekman. And Kruger and Beekman are both big New York merchants. Uh, and he was soon basically running the business, a very gifted businessman, a very fine mind. Uh, and um, he's also early on distinguishes himself as a, um, as a great writer. And the event that really launched uh, uh, Hamilton's uh, public career in the United States was a hurricane that struck the West Indies in 1772, a horrifically destructive one. This is a watercolor. It's not a great image on the PowerPoint, but painted by the English watercolorist Thomas Hearn of the effects produced by the hurricane on nearby island of Antigua. Uh, so, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, Hamilton wrote a description of that, uh, um, of that hurricane in a letter 
uh, that uh, uh, he sent it to the Danish governor. It was reprinted, uh, widely circulated, describing the hurricane. And here you get just a taste of how he was writing at the uh, tender age of, what is he, 15 when he wrote this. It's impossible for me to describe uh, uh, or you to form any idea of it, the hurricane. And then of course he proceeds to describe it. The roaring of the sea and wind, fiery meteors flying about it in the air, the prodigious glare of almost perpetual lightning, the crash of the falling houses and the ear piercing shrieks of the distressed were sufficient to strike astonishment into angels. So, uh, you know, you get a sense of, uh, he's 15 years old, but he's already writing with, uh, uh, you know, considerable uh, maturity, and largely as a result of the fame that uh, uh, Hamilton acquired as a result of this performance, uh, a group of merchants on St. Croix took up a subscription uh, to send him north to North America to get an education. Uh, these. Uh, Hamilton, of course, as his name suggests, is out of a, a Scottish Presbyterian background. Their idea was to uh, send him to New Jersey uh, to spend a year in preparatory school, and then he would complete his education at the College of New Jersey, what is today Princeton University. Uh, and, um, and so off he went. Uh, first to Princeton and then to New York. And it's again, it's easy to forget what a gifted writer he was, but throughout his career, Hamilton made quite a mark with his writing, most famously the Federalist Papers explaining the Constitution and defending it during the ratification debates in New York, which he wrote with John Jay and James Madison. Uh, his Treasury Report of uh, 1791. It doesn't sound like compelling reading, but it is also quite a literary performance. Okay, so, um, so you know, so Hamilton, uh, the, you know, uh, orphan, impoverished, but rising by dint of hard work, application, and, and, and genius. Uh, you know, off he went to New Jersey, uh, where another trait immediately manifested itself, and that is his ambition. Uh, he spent a year at a preparatory school, uh, was uh, admitted or would have been admitted to Princeton, except he was not willing to, uh, uh, that, or Princeton rather, uh, the faculty was not willing to allow him to advance at his own pace. Uh, you know, Hamilton had ambitions that couldn't be contained by Princeton. So instead, he went to King's College in New York, what is today Columbia University. And by moving to New York, uh, he, uh, he also moved to what was the center of, or a center of the emerging radical uh, resistance to Britain. Uh, and Hamilton became quite active while keeping up with his studies, but quite active in politics, very much on the radical side of things, uh, uh, giving speeches, writing pamphlets and articles uh, during the winter of 1774-75. Uh, the revolution had not begun, but that's a very fraught moment if you know anything about the, the coming of the American Revolution. And then he moved on to the army where he dreamed of military glory. And again, the musical captures this side of it. He was an artillery captain, uh, which is a very technical uh, uh, position. Uh, you've got to have a good command of mathematics, trigonometry. Uh, uh, to, to be in the artillery, uh, you have to have quite a lot of knowledge. Uh, and he saw service uh, in the field uh, throughout 1776. Um, his greatest gifts, though, were organizational. And on that basis, he attracted the attention of George Washington, the commander in chief of the Continental Army. And he became indispensable to Washington as his aide de camp. Uh, and the, the uh, musical, the, the, the Hamilton musical captures that side of things very well. Uh, this tension between, you know, uh, Alexander dreaming of military glory, but where he's really needed uh, is helping Washington run the army and, and hold things together. Uh, and, and of course, it had been those organizational schools that had, skills that had also marked him out 
uh, as a clerk in uh, the uh, office of Kruger and Beekman, the New York uh, merchants in the West Indies. So uh, it's really that that or those organizational skills that enable his rise from poverty first in Nevis and then in New York to the upper echelons of politics and society. Uh, the screen, the slide you're seeing here uh, on the, in the upper uh, left is a map of New York from 1776. You see that most of New York at this time is still, Manhattan is still uh, a, an island, it's farmland. Uh, uh, New York was really limited to the lower tip of uh, Manhattan and then, in the lower right, you see a famous uh, a painting. This is actually a 19th century lithograph showing uh, the crowd, uh, the New York crowd toppling the statue of George III. It's one of the most radical uh, mob actions of the uh, Revolutionary War. And of course, Hamilton is present uh, for that. Okay, so Hamilton, the self-made man, uh, he's, he distinguishes himself uh, very early on. Um, and uh, he joins the Continental Army, he sees battle, but it's really organization uh, where he distinguishes himself. And, and it, his training in college is as an attorney and, and throughout his adult, adult life, uh, he also practices as a lawyer. Well, within the Continental Army, like most Continental Army officers, Hamilton was a nationalist. And that meant that what he wanted was a stronger federal government than the Articles of Confederation allowed. Uh, and um, you know, one of the things I really miss about speaking on Zoom rather than uh, a live audience, I'd love to put a question to you. You know, what do you know about the Artist Confederation? And uh, you know, the, usually there's uh, there are quite a few people who do know things about the Articles. Uh, of course, the first thing about the Articles that most people will say it was the United States' first federal constitution, which is true. Uh, as soon as Congress declared independence, they set about uh, uh, drafting. Uh, um, Articles of Confederation, that is literally this document. And like the Constitution, it consisted of, of a series of articles. Uh, and um, the, the articles themselves are finalized in 1777. They're not ratified. Uh, they have to be ratified by all 13 states. They're not ratified until 1781 when Maryland uh, and Virginia finally ratify, uh, but they remain in force until 1789 when they are re replaced by the conf by our current constitution, which is still the United States uh, uh, Federal Charter. So the Arrows of Confederation are, um, they create a permanent union. They form the 13 states into a union that is to be permanent and enduring. Um, uh, and uh, they, they turn Congress into a kind of executive and Congress governs through a series of committees. Eventually in 1781, they create a kind of executive. So you can see this as an embryonic or nascent federal government, but there are some key differences that matter a lot. And these really bothered nationalists like uh, Hamilton. One involved the power to tax. Uh, and of course, in 1776, when the articles were first drafted, uh, uh, the Congress had just declared independence from Britain because the British Parliament was trying to tax the Americans. The last thing Americans wanted was to create a new parliament, if you will, with powers to tax. So uh, the, under the Arrows of Confederation, Congress did not have the power to tax directly. Instead, Congress raised funds uh, by uh, through requisitions or volunteer or, or quotas from the states. Uh, and Congress would assign each state, this was done by estimated population, uh, a quota. And each year a state was expected to supply Congress with its quota. Um, and the states could tax. So uh, indirectly, there is taxation, but it's coming from the states and not from Congress. Uh, the other really important thing to know about the Artists of Confederation is that 
the only way to amend the Articles of Confederation was for all 13 states to agree. So there had been, not everybody thinks not letting Congress tax isn't a good idea. You know, we're up against the most powerful uh, uh, army and Navy in the world. You know, maybe we should let Congress raise taxes. Uh, there had been uh, people in Congress who had moved for those powers, but they'd been defeated. Uh, but there continue to be proposals. The problem is in, in order to actually implement such a measure, all 13 states would have to agree. And within the Confederation Congress, uh, the delegates did not vote individually. Instead, they voted as state delegations. So New Hampshire would get one vote, Massachusetts would get one vote, New York has one vote, Virginia, Georgia, South Carolina, and so forth. So um, it is, uh, and, and in fact, under the Arrows Confederation, it's actually the states that are sovereign. Uh, and if you read the Arrows Confederation, I encourage you to do this. I didn't do it till graduate school. It's not you know, something most of us would think to do. Uh, but uh, you see that in many ways, the Arrows Confederation looks more like uh, the charter of an alliance, an alliance between sovereign states where the real effective powers still reside with the states. So, um, and it makes a lot of sense if you think about what had caused the American Revolution. This is a very natural way to set up your government. The problem is it's not a great way to uh, 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 fight a war, uh, issue a currency, or fund your army. And of course, the big expense uh, in all governments before the 20th century in the welfare state was defense. Uh, that, that's, that's what cost the most money. And the whole purpose for these articles was to keep the Continental Army and the Continental Navy in the field, but the Continental Army is the one that really matters. Well, even though Congress can't tax, they can issue currency, which they proceed to do uh, issuing a new currency called the continental dollar. Uh, now the dollar, and again, if we were live, I'd love to know if anyone knows where's the dollar come from. Uh, it was a Spanish currency. It actually goes back to, uh, uh, it has roots in the Habsburg dominions of central uh, Europe. The dollar uh, uh, was uh, um, a, a currency out of the, uh, of the, the Austrian empire. The, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which uh, the Spanish turn into dollar. Uh, and the dollar becomes sort of the international currency of the colonial period, uh, um, not just in Spain, but in, uh, in the other colonies in the New World. And the continental, so uh, Congress declares that it will issue a currency pegged to the Spanish mill dollar, but they're gonna call it the continental dollar. Uh, and, um, and they do issue some of these as coins. You can see on the screen here, a continental silver dollar, uh, which has uh, you know, the, the designated weight that a Spanish mill dollar would have. But a lot of what they issue are promissory notes where they promise to pay the bearer in hard currency uh, at a set date, which could be one, two, three years hence. The problem, of course, if you're issuing currency, but you can't raise taxes, I mean, you do raise some taxes. The states do uh, pay some of the requisitions, but they never pay as much as they say they're going to. So Congress is constantly short of hard cash. Uh, and as a result, the dollar plummets in value. At first it's gradual, but by 1778-79, uh, there is intense inflation, uh, incredibly disruptive, uh, and it leads to all sorts of problems. Things really hit bottom in 1780. During the spring of 1780, the British capture Charleston, South Carolina. They, they basically take over the entire state of South Carolina. Uh, it looks as though they may take the entire uh, 
uh, the Carolinas and Georgia out of the war. It, it looks as though the British may actually win this war. Uh, the dollar becomes worthless uh, and uh, it leads to a crisis which results in the appointment of this man, Robert Morris, as a superintendent of finance, uh, someone incidentally to whom Alexander Hamilton is quite close. I'm gonna come back to Hamilton in a minute here. Uh, and Morris sets about reforming federal finances. He's helped immensely by the fact that France has entered the, the, war, the Revolutionary War, allied with the United States, and they are lending Congress money in the form of hard currency, gold and silver. Uh, so Morris leverages that uh, and um, he creates a new department of the treasury. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of what he's thinking of is that the, the United States needs to have a government of sort of a fiscal system, kind of like Britain. And the really interesting thing about this particular uh, uh, painting is over Morris's, his right shoulder to our left, is a building that uh, if you, uh, again, I'd love to ask if anybody knows what it is, it's the Bank of England. Uh, this is painted in 1781 or 82, <laughs> war isn't over. And here's Robert Morris saying, you know, we want a government like England's that can actually pay for the debt. Uh, and uh, the problem is to do that, he has to get all 13 states to agree to a new tax. It's going to be a federal tariff on imports, a 5% tariff. 12 of the states say, okay. I mean, the things are pretty serious. One state says no. That state is the mighty sovereign state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island says no. The smallest state in the union, but under the Arles of Confederation, they have the power to say no, and they do. Uh, it's a huge blow and it opens up one of the darkest moments in the history of the American Revolution. And that is the so-called Newburgh Conspiracy. Uh, the Continental Army is encamped in uh, Newburgh, New York. This is after Yorktown in the winter of 1782, 1783. And a group of officers, possibly with Hamilton's involvement, Hamilton knows what's going on, uh, we think, uh, uh, creates a conspiracy. They don't let Washington in on it because they think, they think Washington isn't going to like this. Turns out they're right. Uh, to uh, refuse to disband until Congress pays them their back pay. And the army hadn't been paid in two years and pays them a pension. Uh, it's probably the closest the United States has ever come to a military coup, um, a military coup. Uh, it's a very dark moment, uh, very threatening. When Washington learns of the conspiracy, which he does in March of 1783, he skillfully faces it down. He walks into the great meeting hall where the meeting is taking place. Uh, uh, he takes the letter that they want to send to Congress he reaches into his pocket and puts on his glasses. Uh, Washington's a vain man. Uh, no one had ever seen him wear glasses before. The hall was stunned. It's an omission of weakness uh, by a proud man who doesn't do that often. And uh, he, he outfoxes the coup leaders. Uh, uh, the, uh, it dissipates. But this continues to be a big problem. There's actually a mutiny by the Pennsylvania Regiment in June of 1783. Uh, they surround Independence Hall where Congress is meeting. Congress is forced to flee, first to Princeton, New Jersey. They end up going to Annapolis. And Washington stages a very carefully scripted resignation of his commission in December of 1783 at the uh, Maryland State House in Annapolis. And, uh, you may have seen this painting. This is from the US Capitol, but a copy is in the Maryland State House. And again, we think Hamilton may have been involved, though he kept his involvement really quiet uh, because messing around with military power like that, uh, an army that refuses to leave the field, that tells its civilian commanders uh, what to do uh, is a very frightening prospect. Um, but that experience makes all involved, 
this includes Washington, who recognizes the, the legitimacy of the Army's concerns, uh, Hamilton, uh, certainly Morris, um, uh, most of the leadership of the Army are in favor of a stronger federal government. And they gather in Philadelphia in 1787, and uh, they, in fact, draft a new constitution, one that gives, uh, gives Congress, it actually creates a new office of the president uh, that in some ways is modeled on the British monarchy. There are elements of kingship about our presidency, uh, uh, a federal judiciary uh, without term limits, uh, um, lifetime appointments if you're appointed to the federal bench, and uh, no term limits for president either originally, and a Congress with the power to tax. Uh, in some ways, what they did was to create an American government that looked like the British government that Americans had overthrown in uh, 1776. It's a, um, it is a very bold move, and it's one that's very controversial. Uh, uh, with most historians uh, agree and uh, think, and I agree with them, that had the Constitution been put to a vote, it probably would not have been ratified. Uh, uh, here in New Hampshire, which of course is the ninth of the 13 states that have to ratify it in order to um, uh, make it legally binding, uh, 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 in all likelihood, it only passes because of the liberal application of food and drink. Uh, um, there, there's a lot of leaning on delegates uh, here in New Hampshire to get them to vote the right way. And uh, it's very controversial uh, in uh, the state of New York. And uh, during the ratification debates in New York, and actually one of the things I neglected to mention, the Arms of Confederation require 13 states to approve an amendment, whereas the Constitution only required nine. So it's also it's changing the rules of the game in that regard too. In fact, Rhode Island doesn't uh, um, ratify the constitution until 1791, two years after Washington had taken office under the constitution. So technically there's a problem for the first two years of Washington's administration, if you think about it. Anyway, so, Hamilton is a strong proponent, strong supporter of the Constitution. He's in the convention. And in New York, he helps spearhead the move to get the document ratified, joining forces with James Madison of Virginia, another Federalist at this point, and John Jay, uh, uh, a fellow New Yorker, uh, and writes a series of uh, papers known as the Federalist Papers uh, um, uh, in 1788. They're initially uh, uh, published in the New York Papers, uh, but uh, they've uh, later collected into bound volumes. Uh, one of the most important American contributions to uh, political thought, my own background is the history of political thought. Uh, um, as you'll know, uh, probably the most famous and important of the Federalist Papers is written by James Madison, Federalist number 10, unfortunately. Hamilton doesn't get that uh, 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 kudo to his credit, but, but Hamilton did write the most as you'll know from the, uh, from the musical. Well, so Hamilton plays a key role in spearheading this new constitution. Uh, one of the key cornerstones of this is going to be a presidency with semi kind of regal monarchical powers, a cabinet, just like the Privy Council of the King of England. And of course, Congress has powers to tax. And probably far and away the most important office. And there are four cabinet offices uh, in Washington's first administration, the Secretary of the Treasury, the most important one, the one that Hamilton gets, the, the uh, Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, uh, and the Attorney General. Those are the original four cabinet level offices. And of course, the Vice President, John Adams. And um, Hamilton sets about creating a daring, daring, uh, you know, his solution to the fiscal crisis is daring, much like his uh, uh, mentor, Robert Morris. He's a great admirer 
of the uh, of the British government, uh, and in fact is accused uh, uh, of being a sort of a closet Anglophile, maybe a monarch, mar a monarchist. Uh, and, but his solution has two parts. One is to create a new federal revenue structure. 80%, uh, and you see this chart here, uh, comes from customs, that is from tariffs on imports and exports, kind of like the failed impost under the Confederation. 20% comes from excise taxation. And um, if you, uh, you know, if you know anything about the coming of the American Revolution, it's that kind of internal taxation that had triggered the big resistance to Parliament, the Stamp Act crisis of 1765. Hamilton uh, uh, goes for it with a 20% excise tax. 25% of that tax, a quarter of that tax, comes from taxes on whiskey and distilled spirits. Uh, I have a little more to say about that. That ends up being deeply controversial. So that's the first part. That all is controversial enough. The other part is to create a new bank to service this debt, the Bank of the United States. Uh, and um, the, the Bank of the United States is a um, kind of hard for us to get our heads around this. It's a private public bank. The, the, the U, US corporate law didn't yet have the sharp distinction between public and private corporations that we do now. Corporations had public roles, but they were also private. And uh, the, way the, uh, the way Hamilton sets up this bank is it's a joint stock corporation. Uh, the shares uh, start at $25. He makes sure that members of Congress, who of course have to approve the charter, have first dibs on those shares. About half of them are sold to members of Congress, senators and representatives. They quickly rise to $300 a share. Basically, Hamilton uses his bank, which needs congressional approval, to put together a working majority in Congress, which is kind of the way the British government had worked in the House of Commons before the, you know, still worked. So there's a lot about this not to like. Uh, and there certainly are uh, uh, Americans who take a dim view of what uh, Hamilton is doing. Though from a fiscal and economic standpoint, Hamilton's bank and revenue are a great success. It gets the American debt under control. It creates a stable currency, which of course merchants like, but it turns out that artisans and ordinary workers like that too. Uh, and so uh, it, it's economically and fiscally, it's a great success. Politically, it's controversial, which I will come back to in uh, a minute. Well. Uh, it ends up being controversial on a much more wider scale. It requires a certain amount of horse trading in Congress as well. And the key concession that Hamilton is forced to make is to concede that the capital will not be in either New York or Philadelphia, but instead will be in the District of Columbia that is on the Potomac River between Virginia and Maryland. And again, if we were in person, I'd love to know if anyone knows why, uh, though the uh, mention of own a judge on the left ought to be a clue. Uh, um, a lot of the opposition to ba Hamilton's bank comes from Southerners, Virginians, they were like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Uh, again, the musical captures that well. Uh, um, a lot of that, uh, but, uh, um, and, uh, the, you know, they have their own reasons for that, but uh, they also uh, 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 have a deep interest in where the capital is located. Uh, in particular, they don't want the capital to be in Pennsylvania, which had taken the first steps toward abolishing slavery in 1780 with a gradual emancipation act. It doesn't really free anyone immediately. It's, you know, uh, they're, they're, it's kind of shameful how slowly even Pennsylvania moved. But what it meant was that legally, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia is now free soil. And, uh, and in fact, 
Southern politicians who are enslavers have a whole, go through a whole series of loops if they want to come up with their enslaved servants and live in the nation's capital in Philadelphia. Uh, and, um, and even when they go through those loops, hoops, jump through those hoops, they aren't always successful. And one of the politicians who isn't is George Washington, who's uh, um, enslaved woman, own a judge, she's actually enslaved to Washington's wife, Martha, flees during his second term in office and uh, escapes eventually to New Hampshire. Uh, where she, uh, 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 you know, first in Portsmouth, then in Greenland, uh, um, she achieves her freedom, uh, and Washington, the Washingtons work really hard to get her back, though she's never caught, and there, of course, is a book about this. Anyway, the way Hamilton, the deal he strikes, and the, the Hamilton, the musical, you know, you get a sense of Hamilton as anti-slavery full stock. In fact, he's willing to cut deals with enslavers. And one of the deals he cuts is over the location of the capital. You vote for my financial program, I'll let you have the capital uh, in uh, on the border between Virginia and Maryland. Because of course, both Virginia and Maryland are slave states and slavery is legal in the District of Columbia, which it isn't anymore in Philadelphia. Okay, so, um, so that's Hamilton, the nationalist, the maker of the federal government. He really, you know, it, it, it's fair enough that his face is on the $10 bill because he is, uh, you know, he really creates the structure that we still have to this day. Finally, I want to talk just real quickly here, briefly about Hamilton, the partisan. Because uh, Hamilton, although he's a, you know, he's a founder, he's a great man, uh, uh, his opponents end up deciding to keep in place his uh, fiscal program. They don't do away with it, though they suggested they would. But Hamilton himself is a, uh, a partisan politician, and he presides over the creation of the first two-party system in the United States. Uh, the first sort of installment in that is the so-called Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the problems with Hamilton's tax system, the excise taxes, particularly that 25% on distilled spirits, hits the kind of the Appalachian Ridge of uh, the uh, 13 states particularly hard. Uh, I grew up in this part of uh, the country. So uh, when I say Pennsylvania, I'm using a term of endearment near to my heart, but basically, the area that today we would call Pennsylvania uh, is particularly hard hit by this, partly because uh, the nearest route to market, water route, is closed off. Spain occupies New Orleans. The cheapest way to get your, your wheat to market is to distill it into whiskey and cart it over the mountains to Baltimore. Uh, and uh, so by taxing whiskey, uh, uh, Hamilton hits these people hard and they respond by rising up in open rebellion. They tar and feather federal ex excise officials, just as it had happened to British officials in the 1760s. Uh, they, they muster in armed formations, kind of like the Sons of Liberty or the Minutemen. Uh, they even erect a guillotine. The French Revolution is now underway uh, and saying, you know, if Alexander Hamilton comes out here, that's what we're going to do with him. Washington responds with strong support from his treasury secretary by declaring the whiskey protesters to be in rebellion. And he marches west at the head of a federalized militia, an army of almost 13,000 soldiers. By the time he gets out there, most of the rebels have gone. There isn't a lot of bloodshed during the whiskey rebellion. So you almost have to put that in inverted quote, inverted commas. But it is a very strong show of force. It's a sign of the popular dissatisfaction and opposition to Hamilton's program, even though it's economically successful. Uh, and uh, of course, the and this show of force itself in some ways is disconcerting too. And here's a painting done by Frederick Kimmelmann, a German painter in, I think, Philadelphia showing Washington marching west at the head of his Western army in 1795. Not a great picture, but you get 
uh, a sense of uh, the image that this was uh, uh, designed to uh, convey. And um, the upshot of this, uh, although Washington and Hamilton put down the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, if you've got a problem with this new government, you don't, you don't realize it at the point of the sword or the muzzle of a gun. Instead, you go to the ballot box. Uh, and as Americans start going to the ballot box, they start sorting themselves into two political parties. And by the mid 1790s, by 1795, uh, politics is being split between uh, the supporters of the Constitution, people like Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, they call themselves Federalists and their opponents led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who had been a Federalist, but he goes over to the other side. They call themselves Democratic Republicans. And, uh, and they're people who worry that this partisan conflict could lead to civil war. Uh, and in fact, it does lead to bloodshed, uh, as I'll say in a minute. Um, but uh, interestingly, you know, a lot of people worry about this, and one of them is, in fact, Alexander Hamilton, who writes Washington's farewell address for him uh, in 1796, where Washington indicates, I'm not going to run for a third term, uh, so we don't get a tradition of pres presidents for life. Uh, and um, one of the things Washington, but it's really Hamilton's words, warns about is party conflict. Uh, but of course, Hamilton himself uh, had done as much as anyone to drive that conflict forward. And during the first contested election in the United States history, pitting sitting President John Adams, who had succeeded Washington as a Federalist president, against the Democratic Republican uh, candidate Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson wins. But it's a very contested election. It goes into the House of Representatives. It takes weeks to resolve. And during that dispute, uh, one of the other Democratic Republican contenders is a man named Aaron Burr, with whom Hamilton had long been their frenemies. Uh, and uh, uh, Hamilton throws the election, throws his support to Jefferson because he thinks correctly that Burr's a dangerous guy. And uh, that, of course, earns him uh, the enduring hostility, hatred of Burr. When Burr, and, and Burr becomes vice president, that's the way the uh, things worked in 1800. After Burr's term as vice president ends in 1804, he runs for governor of New York, where Hamilton fights against him and in fact, throws the governorship to his opponent. Burr loses there. He's furious. Uh, he challenges Hamilton. The two men fight a duel. Hamilton, of course, is willing to fight a duel. He's, he's a proud, ambitious partisan. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, he loses his life uh, in New Jersey on July 11, 1804. So, um, so that, in a nutshell, is uh, Alexander Hamilton, a uh, self-made man, very American, uh, really, as much as anyone, the architect of our national government, uh, particularly the financial side of things, uh, and uh, one of the founders of our two-party system, which, for better or worse, is still very much a part of our politics. Uh, and. Uh, isn't quite as heated as it once was, but you know we could have a talk about that too. Uh, no, people aren't fighting duels at the moment. We'll put it that way. Okay, all right. So I'll leave it there. Happy to entertain questions and uh, put that back up. Okay, great. We have our first question. Uh, what was Alexander Hamilton doing between the end of the Revolution and the Constitutional Convention? Oh, thank you. That's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm actually doing quite a lot with Alexander Hamilton in the book I'm writing, which is really about that period. I, I include the Constitution, but I'm spending a lot of time on what we call the Confederation. So Amel, Alexander Hamilton goes into private practice as an attorney. A lot of his law cases are about um, commerce, 
uh, international trade. Uh, New York, of course, is a major port. A lot of trade actually down to the West Indies. Uh, um, he actually has some contact uh, with his older brother uh, who lives into the 1780s. But um, the other thing he's doing is working to make the Arts of Confederation stronger. For the first, until about 1785, uh, most Americans who wanted a stronger government wanted that to happen within the Arrows Confederation. It's only gradually that they, um, they, they turn away from that. And uh, Hamilton gets involved in a very important case in New York uh, over uh, the protection of British property under the um, treaty. Uh, and the state of New York wants to seize this uh, for, uh, for patriots, supporter of the government. And Hamilton represents the loyalist uh, who's being sued and wins. And what he's trying to do is turn the treaty into and the Confeder Artists Confederation together into a kind of constitution. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, these are interesting arrangements. We've largely forgotten about it, but a number of really important parts of our legal system are pioneered uh, during this period, right before the constitution. And Hamilton's very actively involved in that as well. And he's also uh, politicking uh, for a constitutional convention. Once they decide they're gonna need a new constitution, he's all, you know, he's actively working for that too. That, that's a good question. Okay, uh, we have um, another question. Curious about your opinion of Ron Chernow's book, Hamilton. That is the book that inspired the play and I find it mind boggling the level of research to write a book so detailed and vast. Yeah, that, yeah that's a great question. I mean, my opinion, I'm impressed. Uh, and you know, um, Writing a book like that is, is, is challenging. I mean, you, you really, you need to, I mean, I, I found this in the book I'm writing. You, you know, I've had to relearn a lot of economics from college. I mean, you've got to write about someone like Hamilton. You, of course, have to know the law. You have to have an appreciation of constitutional history. And you really need to understand commerce, uh, you know, things like exchange rates uh, and, you um, the, the elaborate uh, um, uh, multifaceted deals that these merchants engage in. And, you know, Hamilton's involved in this sort of thing. And, and if you read his report on the uh, treasury, uh, and he also writes a report on the commerce of the United States. I mean, he really grasped this stuff. And, you know, you can't hope to write about it if you don't you know, get, get a sense of it as well. So, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, Cherno does a wonderful job with that, but while also bringing the man, you know, Hamilton, the person to life. And, I, you know, I, I know one of the things that is attractive about Hamilton is he has feet of clay. You know, we, we, we have a tendency to put our founders up on pedestals. You know, we kind of you know, think of them as carved in marble. Yeah, I mean, there are marble statues of Alexander Hamilton, but <laughs> the, guy, the guy is definitely not perfect. And, and I think that is part of his appeal. Uh, you know, he's got a temper. <laughs> he dies in a duel. <laughs> you know? Okay, John, John says and then asks, you say many of the founding documents had roots in, from England. I heard that some was based on Native American, perhaps the Iroquois Confederation. Thoughts? So, um, yeah, there's, what I would say to that is, um, a lot of the, uh, I think the connection is less direct copying or modeling Iroquois um, uh, constitutional forms than it is uh, working out ideas about confederation and empire and government in dialogue with the Iroquois. So the, the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee uh, um, League uh, were the 
uh, principal indigenous power in uh, uh, Eastern North America, Northeastern North America in the 17th into the 18th century. And uh, this goes back to colonial times. And this is a New York story. The state of the colony of New York uh, developed what was called the Covenant Chain, which is a, uh, a an alliance system that bound uh, uh, the, the crown, the British king through New York to the Iroquois Confederacy, the five nations later to become six. And, and that covenant chain also links the Iroquois to a number of other dependent indigenous peoples uh, within them. And uh, in fact, the first attempt at a, a, a pan North American Union is at Albany in 1754, where the, the, in where the colonists are there meeting with the Iroquois to try to create a, a viable union. This is at the start of what we call the French and Indian War. Franklin is present. We oftentimes look at that Albany Confederation, Albany Union, which doesn't pan out, uh, but as the first attempt uh, at what Congress would do in the mid 1770s. And the Iroquois have a very important part of that um, but I would say the union is more a design to create a meaningful relationship with them rather than taking ideas from the Iroquois and applying it to American experience. I would say insofar as there's a model for the Confederation, it's the Dutch Republic uh, in Holland, the States General. The, the American Confederation looks a lot like the Dutch Republic in the 1780s. Um, they're, they're looking at Switzerland and Poland, Lithuania too. There are other confederations that they're looking at. Um, so did Hamilton have any connections to slavery? Did he ever own slaves? Uh, you know, I should have looked that up uh, before. Uh, <laughs> I could look it up now. Uh, I mean, I mean, he's in the way. I mean, the answer to the answer to that is absolutely. He's in the West Indies. Uh, if you're working in a merchant firm uh, in St. Croix, uh, you're involved in enslavement. Uh, and uh, uh, so you know, the, the commodities you're trading are uh, slave grown. Uh, chances are you're shipping it on board ships that have enslaved labor on them. Uh, the dock workers loading and unloading are enslaved. So yeah, in that sense, absolutely. Like a number of founders uh, and oftentimes, you know, some of the first anti-slavery statements come from places that are actually on the border and involved with enslavement. Uh, it, it's, uh, um, we see this in New England as well. Uh, Boston's heavily involved in slavery and the slave trade. Uh, and it's also where there, where we see some of the first stirrings of anti-slavery, same thing with Philadelphia. So, you know, Hamilton, when he, when he writes against slavery, it's genuine, but he's also involved in it and his law practice. Uh, uh, anyone involved in shipping goods to the West Indies, which is where a lot of American commerce travels after the revolution as well as before, is make, making money off of slavery. Uh, I've spent some time recently in insurance documents. You know, if you're selling insurance, it, chances are in some way you're, you're, you're selling insurance on slavery. It, it, I mean, it makes for depressing reading. Uh, and so anyone involved in commerce is involved with slavery in some way. Okay, uh, John says, I heard on PBS that Hamilton's refusal to pay France back for their incredible support as foreign debt while paying colonist debt and that failure led in great part to the French Revolution since uh, the king wanted to raise taxes on his nobility subjects who refused and the king lost his head. Lafayette helped nobility and peasants topple the monarchy. Does not sound very just to me. Horrible karma for America. <laughs> Comment? Uh, well, there's a lot in that. Uh, um, I, I, mean, I mean, the position of France the relationship of France to the revolution is a very, very complicated one. 
Uh, and uh, in some ways, La Lafayette is a very interesting actor in all of that. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, when he's in the Continental Army, uh, uh, Hamilton is definitely in the pro-France uh, 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 camp. Uh, and in fact, the nationalists tended to also be big supporters of the French alliance. Uh, but in Washington's administration, he's on the pro-British side. And uh, a lot of his resistance to, uh, quote, paying France back is he doesn't want the United States to enter France's revolutionary wars as their allies, which under the Anglo-French Treaty of 1778, uh, the United States was theoretically supposed to do. It's a big, it's a legal question. So Hamilton himself pivots on that. Uh, he's not entirely consistent. He certainly does not like the French Revolution himself. Uh, uh, and Hamilton, you know, I, I think it's worth pointing out that even though he's involved in radical politics in New York in the 1775, he's ultimately a fairly conservative guy. Uh, and the Federalist Party uh, is in many ways the, the birthplace of American conservatism, at least its business class side of things. Uh, going back to the slavery issue, April says that um, Hamilton's father-in-law did own slaves, but he did not. He surely, he being Alexander Hamilton surely was involved with slavery, but according to the book Hamilton, no records were found to show he ever owned slaves. Okay. Yeah, that yes, that could be. And in fact, one of the, I mean, I'm sure it is. And we you do see this, you see it in Boston and, and Rhode Island as well. Uh, uh, people who before the revolution might have owned a few. Uh, enslaved household servants, a very common form of slavery in all the ports, uh, don't do so after the revolution. And so Hamilton would fit that model. Um, but it, the, uh, um, just anyone, the, the, the interconnection between overseas trade and slavery, uh, you know, the, his law practice, we, the, um, and you can go actually a good place to look at this, the, the National Archives uh, has a collection called Founders Online and they have the papers of Hamilton, Washington, Jefferson, Madison uh, um, and several others, John Jay is now in there. And, uh, you know, just doing searches for contemporary terms that people would have used, uh, slave, uh, Negro is another term that, that will crop up in there. And you very quickly see uh, just how involved even people who don't own slaves themselves are indirectly in the, uh, the, the you know, uh, in the business of slavery. Um, I just want to touch on uh, Ona Judge. We, yeah. we actually had the author of Never Caught come right. and speak at the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. And we had a first person in person, a first person presentation of Ona Judge with, that was several years ago, but mm -hmm. the video of it is on our website under oh. program videos um, for yeah. anyone who's interested in that. Yeah. Um, we, at the moment, we just have two more uh, questions. What were Hamilton's parents doing in Nevis and St. Croix? Saint Croix? Uh, they are, they're merchants. Uh, his father is uh, a merchant uh, and, and, you know, the, the uh, Hamilton himself said that the separate, that, that he left because of business failure. Uh, and uh, so, and, and after he leaves, his, mo his mother runs a store. Uh, so, um, so yeah, they're on the merchant side of things. Uh, I think her estranged husband was a planter, but of course that's not Hamilton's father. Okay. And uh, did Hamilton stay in touch with his brother? You actually mentioned that he spoke. Yeah, there, 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 there is very brief uh, contact, but they, they go in totally different uh, directions. I, I mean, it's just, uh, uh, um, I, 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 his, his brother's an artisan of some sort, I believe, um, and uh, so. All right, and any, any other people from his childhood would he have had contact with later in life? Well, I, you know, I don't know. It, it's, uh, um, 
Yeah, I don't know how in touch he stayed with pe with people from uh, St. Croix and Nevis. Uh, you know, his, his, his circle was very much a New York, North American one. Um, you know, you could be, I mean, and again, the musical captures that sense of starting over again uh, very well. Certainly. Okay, it, it looks like uh, you've answered all of the questions and um, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation, for coming oh. back and presenting to us again. Oh. And, it's, um, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Laura. It's, it's been fun. And again, hopefully we can do something again sometime in person. <laughs>